good morning. It is a good morning. <laughs> we have both audio and video. <laughs> it's a good morning. <laughs> so welcome this morning. I hope you've had a good week and you're not from Texas. And if you are, we pray for you. <sighs> Interesting times that we live in. And we must be prepared. This morning I'm going to be talking about Agni Yoga and the chalice. Let me start with this quote from the book called Fiery World, Volume 1. A neophyte asked a Rishi who spoke to him about Agni, if I constantly repeat the word Agni, will I have any benefit from it? The Rishi answered, of course. In the same way, we repeat about the various qualities and analogies of the great Agni. May the people accept this sound in the chalice. The chalice, just as a heart, is especially close to the concept of brotherhood. The chalice is the repository of everything loved and precious. Sometimes, much that has been gathered into the chalice remains concealed for many lives. But if the concept of brotherhood has been impressed upon the chalice, it will resound with both joy and yearning in all lives. To people who are cognizant of it, even in an hour of difficulties and clashes, the concept of brotherhood will be a saving factor. So the chalice. The chalice, as it is understood in Agni Yoga, is made of pure and higher etheric matter. That's the chalice. It is not only a container, as we would imagine, but also a device. This is so beautiful. It is also a device to communicate with the higher worlds. That's the chalice. A device for communication with higher worlds and also with all systems of the human commute of the human constitution. Isn't that interesting? It's the chalice. And as the master says, it is the repository of everything loved and precious. A human being has their chalice in the higher mental body. Higher ethers are sometimes called cosmic ethers, which form the etheric body of the planetary logo. And so where these are words where you may not totally understand it. The idea is it is through the chalice that we com can communicate with the soul of the planet. We don't have to know the term planetary logos. We don't have to understand what higher ethers are, but to recognize it is through our chalice that we can actually connect with the soul of our planet. The planetary logos is the soul of the planet. So for a basic definition of the chalice, the chalice is the repository of our duties and responsibilities. It's the repository of our duties and responsibilities. And we could talk for hours about that, but I, okay, we can do, no, we can't, okay. <laughs> Imagine spending a whole day talking about our duties and responsibilities that are within the chalice. Anyway, when you read about the lives of Nicholas and Helena Rourke, the founders of the Agni Yoga Society, 
you recognize the examples of responsibilities and duties a person has when their chalice has been impressed by the concept of brotherhood. Nicholas Rourke was twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. The Banner of Peace was proposed by Nicholas Rourke for an international pact for the protection of cultural values. The Banner of Peace is a symbol of the Rourke Pact that Rourke established and was signed by 21 countries. This is a symbol <laughs> of the pact, the Banner of Peace. This pact was the first international treaty dedicated to the protection of artistic and scientific institutions and historical monuments. Imagine this pact was signed by 21 countries. Just imagine, they saw the value and the importance of their culture, of their art, of their science, and particularly during wartime, they wanted these monuments to be protected. So 21 countries agreed, and they actually signed this pact. Nicholas Rourke was a master artist whose paintings are valued even today in the hundreds of thousands of dollars and are housed in several museums around the world dedicated to his artwork. In the United States, there is a museum in New York City that carries his name, and it's called the Nicholas Rourke Museum. His many books and articles are still in print. Books such as The Invincible, Realm of Light, Shambhala, Hemavat, and many others. The Chalice, the repository of duties and responsibilities. Now, Helena Rourke, her birthday we celebrated almost a couple of weeks ago on the 12th of February. So it was about, what, 10 days ago. Helena Rourke is described as, and I quote, she who carries the chalice of the sacred fire. Her husband, Nicholas, wrote this about her. Here we encounter a remarkable contemporary figure, an outstanding Russian woman from her father's bookcase. At an unusually early age, she took volumes on philosophy. Amidst the noisy and seemingly distracting environment, she was able to develop a profound contemplation of life, as if she had possessed it long ago. All difficulties and dangers were endured under her stoic leadership. Now, Sina Fosdick. Sina Fosdick, the first director of the Nicholas Rourke Museum in New York, wrote, Elena Ivanova was a very private person, and that's Elena Rourke, and they often just called her E.I. She was a very private person, Sina Fosdick wrote, she said only, Sina said, only after we had been working together for a few years was when she and I became close did I begin to record many of her stories about herself, her childhood, and youth. She was a sensitive child, very impressionable, and sharply observant. She loved beauty in nature and the harmony of colors. She was a gifted musician. She liked to draw and had an unerring sense of color throughout her life. Her knowledge 
of ancient teachings and Eastern philosophy was extraordinary. She spoke a lot about the necessity of awakening women's consciousness and highlighted the need for striving to knowledge and beauty. By the time Helena Rourke was six years old, she spoke three languages. Elena herself wrote, woman, a mother and a wife, a witness of development of man's genius, can appreciate the great value of the culture of thought and knowledge. She often spoke about the role of woman in the evolution and the evolution of humanity. She wrote, let the woman keep all of her beauty and not lose the softness of the heart, the subtlety of feeling, self-sacrifice, and the courage of patience. And all of this that I'm sharing is from Sina Fosdick book that White Mountain published, translated from the Russian into English, about Sina Fosdick's experiences with the Rourkes and the original members of, that were gathered together and eventually formed the Agni Yoga Society. So it was called, what was it called? Uh, what was it called, the title of that book? The Meeting at the Ma My Masters? No, what was the title of that book? You can't, we've, we've only spent years putting that book together. <laughs> anyway, it's a great book. Okay, so moving on. <laughs> when you observe your co-workers, those who are dedicated to building the chalice, you can watch how the burden of their responsibilities and duties increase along with their joy and commitment. You can observe how their humility and virtue increase. You can observe how they renounce their personalities, their lower nature. You learn about their dedication you learn about their renunciation and personal sacrifices. You recognize their nerves of steel. You learn about their experiences with the Brotherhood and the difficulties that they encounter. So we are told that building the chalice is not for the faint-hearted. Each of us must be very careful to carry our chalice with self-respect and dignity. We must carry it carefully because as our duties and responsibilities increase, the difficulties and clashes will multiply. The disciple will have many challenges and crises points to pass. Such a person must meet each conflict as a warrior of spirit, steadfast, daring, and powerful. Because of their strenuous preparation and striving, all cracks in their nature will be sealed. And not one precious drop of energy will be wasted on things like self-pity, anger, doubt, or fear. The chalice will be held upright because it contains the most sacred accumulation of the precious jewels in the kingdom. I was thinking earlier on the drive over here about Saint Sergius, who was an incarnation of Master Moria. I had an opportunity to see the chalice of Saint Sergius. It's magnificent. I mean, it's full of jewels and it of course symbolizes everything that we're talking about here with the chalice. 
So that physical chalice, if you know the story about St. Sergius, when he was giving Holy Communion, there was a moment where some of the people that were around him as he was celebrating communion, where this fiery being came into existence. Angels appeared, and this great fire seemed to engulf the whole of the altar. As he was holding that chalice, all of this was subjective, and you had to have psychically developed eyes to see it in a developed heart, and apparently one of his disciples was able to see all of this taking place. So I remember that story that I read in this chalice that is the most magnificent chalice you could even imagine, and put those the story and the chalice, the beauty of that chalice together, and think about our own chalices, what it represents to us, and how we carry the content of this chalice, which is made of everything that we have done that is good and beautiful, and humanitarian. We carry this with us, life after life after life. And this is what becomes our potential. So even though we don't always need what we carry in that chalice each lifetime, when we need it, it is there. And what is there is called grace. So the chalice holds all of our good thoughts, our good emotions, even our good actions. These are called life-giving substance. Good thoughts, good emotions, and good actions. The chalice is full of manifested and unmanifested seeds. That in itself, see, there's another full day conversation. What does it mean? Manifested and unmanifested seeds. So there's a seed thought to think about. Sometimes the seeds sprout and bloom in such a way in this life that you become a violinist, a composer, a singer a teacher of the ageless wisdom, a scientist. In some way, through various conditions or impact of certain energies, the flowers of your lotus, the chalice, begin to bloom. Many other seeds will remain asleep. The accumulation of your many experiences throughout the ages your knowledge, experience, wisdom, inspiration, impressions, great revelations, all of these things are in your chalice. It's like, haven't you heard yourself say, how did I know that? Or how am I able to do this? It's because of the seeds in the chalice. Experience, wisdom, inspiration, impressions, great revelations. All of these things are in your chalice. The chalice is the repository of spiritual consciousness and contact with higher forces. It is the seat of greater contact with the creativity within your true self. It holds a contact with the genius, this is so cool, with the genius who is sleeping within your nature. When you touch this center, you release a tremendous amount of energy and electricity into your system. If your vehicles have small cracks in them, then they will not be able to hold the energy, your vehicles, your bodies, 
elements in your human constitution will not be able to hold the energy because the energy is going to escape. If this happens, you will be out of control and at the mercy of the unleashed energy which is exhausting itself in one of your vehicles. So for example, we are told when you put yourself on the path of meditation and striving to do so reasonably, not fanatically, with meditation to start five minutes a day. Because then through that five minutes of daily meditation, those cracks become repaired. Slowly, slowly, the cracks become repaired. And through this, what's the word, reparation? Is that the right word? Sounds good. I like that word. Anyway, <laughs> as these cracks in our nature become repaired, see, now this energy that is coming to us, this fiery energy, and again, just think of this image of St. Sergius when he was administering the Holy Communion. This great fire, you know, is throughout the whole altar. You can just image this. If I was an artist, I could explain it better, but I can see it in my head. This is the fire that is in our chalice and as our duties and responsibilities increase, then we have this fire that we carry with us. But if we have leaks and breaks and crevices in our human constitution, we can't hold the energy. And so this is why we start the process of meditation and striving slowly, slowly, slowly to give time for repair. There is a verse in the book Super Mundane where the master is talking about those who want to build the chalice, about those who want to serve hierarchy and humanity. He warns us that those who are building the chalice and will carry the chalice will be severely tested. And this is what he says. Each one who wishes to serve with us knows that he will have to endure the assaults of darkness. In other words, everyone is ready to do this, but in deeds will try to avoid it. He says, does no one realize that every deviation lengthens his path? Combat with darkness is unavoidable, and the waves of chaos will engulf bold fighters. The waves of chaos will engulf bold fighters. Let them learn first about the difficulties of the journey and clearly understand the fight with darkness. Let them not hope to avoid it. The path to joy cannot be easy. There will also be joy. The path, the path to joy is not easy, but there will be joy. The Master M warns us that there are dangers in building the chalice and that it takes heroes to build the chalice. The more you want to be good, you find out that more people become ugly against you. The more you become harmless, people try to be more harmful towards you. The more you forgive, the more they hate you. That is the friction that eventually creates the blooming of your chalice. Isn't that interesting? 
Well, think about our great heroes that we know about. Martin Luther King. You know, we recently just celebrated his life. Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, Mother Teresa, <laughs> you know, carried those chalices. Our spiritual bank account is the chalice. One minute you see you are going to die. The next minute you are alive. Something protected you. Your chalice paid your debt. If you had a real experience like this, real, not, oh, you know, I could have. No, you know you would have. You were right there on the threshold of death and something stopped you. Now you have the answer. One minute you see you are going to die, and the next minute you are alive. Your chalice paid your debt. Sometimes you have a strong need for a question to be answered. What to do? Should I do this or should I do that? The chalice will give you hints. All of these experiences are grace. The nice thing about this kind of an account is you never lose it. If it pays one of your debts, your chalice does not decrease. The chalice always accumulates, but the teaching tells us there is one danger. That danger is when the records of your evil deeds increase in your permanent atoms. When the records of your evil deeds increase in your permanent atoms more than your chalice, then your chalice may not be able to rescue you. As you build the chalice, you become beautiful. The more beautiful you become, the more you respect beauty. The more spiritual you become, the more you attract spiritual people. Every achievement increases your magnetism, your power to attract people. To build your chalice requires getting rid of your ego and getting rid of your vanities. So here's a definition of ego, <laughs> in case you don't know what it is, and a definition of vanity. So ego demands things, and ego and ego demands things, tries to impose his will or forces things. An ego is selfish and touchy. An ego tries to give orders without being in a position of command. An ego thinks he is very important. An ego wants to be praised. An ego shows off and enjoys doing so. An ego tries to find errors or failures in others to feel better about himself. So that's ego. Vanity, we are told that those who have vanity are better off to stay away from the teaching because the teaching can be a very fertile ground for the development of vanity. Vanity is the creation of false images about yourself. Vanities make us artificial. Vanities imposes its image on our true self and makes our true identity disappear. The petals in our lotus will not be able to grow and flower as long as they are trapped under the blanket of vanity. Isn't that interesting? 
The chalice, I said, is found in the higher mind. I said this earlier. It is just like a lotus, and it has 12 petals. Everything we think, feel, and do goes into this chalice, into this mechanism. Now, let me, let me repeat. Let me go back. Everything goes into our mechanism, but only of the chalice, but only the best and the finest and the goodest <laughs> goes into the chalice. Nothing goes into the chalice unless it is related to knowledge, love, and sacrifice. Knowledge and love and sacrificial acts. The petals record. Think of this. The petals, this great recording system records only those actions and words and feelings and motives and thoughts that are related to pure knowledge, pure love, and real sacrificial service. Now, this is what is so incredibly, magnificently beautiful to know. The chalice, when unfolded, can communicate with other unfolded chalices. The chalice, when unfolded, can communicate with other unfolding chalices. So chalices can draw treasures from other chalices and use them for the service of humanity. Now this is just a little, little, little example, but I was thinking, you know, over the years of having experiences like this, and one of the first experiences was when I was asked to give a lecture at the Aquarian Educational Group, uh, which was Torquem's group that he founded, Torquem Ceridarian. And he had this big, beautiful, spiritually charged building that to me was like a chalice in itself. Anyway, so I had an opportunity to give a lecture, and oh, it took me six months to prepare that lecture. <laughs> six months. I was so freaking nervous and afraid and because I was going to give this in front of my teacher. So the irony of it all is when I went up to that stage, I gave a presentation that I could not have given on my own. And I could, it was an energy, it wasn't the words, it was the energy behind it. And I finally realized this is how we can use the treasury of someone else's unfolding chalice that is greater than our own. There's nothing like it, there was nothing like it. It was such an extraordinary experience I've never forgotten and every time it happened, you know, I gave another presentation and he was there. It was the same thing. I said, but this isn't me. What is it? It's the, his chalice. Chalices can draw treasures from other chalices and use them for the service of humanity. We see evidence of this truth within the life of spiritual groups. We bring our talents and resources to the group which combines with the talents and resources of others in the group. This is one example of how the chalices of one another are in communication. This exchange of communication can be visible or invisible. A teacher can lend some of the beauty of their chalice to you when you are in need. For a while you feel so high, but then you return to your normal level of consciousness. And this can happen to a whole group. The leader can raise the consciousness and the spirituality of the entire group so high for many years and then the teacher leaves. And then everyone returns in that group back to normal, a normal level of consciousness. It's interesting. 
And that would be another thing we could talk about all day long. <laughs> so we have three points we could talk about all day long. Or you may be sick and unable to heal yourself. If your life is deserving and your karma allows it, your teacher can send you a ray from their chalice to help you heal. We give freely of our talents and resources to one another and to the group, which builds the treasury of the group and groups. For those who are sensitive to the group chalice, they can draw from that chalice to increase their love and knowledge and power, which will strengthen their own hands and feet for group and humanitarian service. The teacher shares their treasury with the disciples in the group just as the Kohans give their treasury to the masters, who then loan their treasury of knowledge, love, and power to their ashram, ashrams found on different planes of consciousness, from the astral to the buddhic plane. In Leaves of Moria's Garden, verse 404, it says, Endeavor not to spill the chalice. It is not uncommon to see a person <clears throat> with power, with knowledge, with talents, and so forth, spill their chalice. How do people spill their chalice through a big ego and vanity? through dishonesty and criminal activities. Because of their power, their money, their this and that, they puff themselves up like a blowfish and eventually become a slave to these things. A slave to their money, a slave to their position, a slave to their self-importance. I bet you we know someone like that. our present, our former administration, our former president. Such a perfect example of what not to be. <laughs> when this happened, well, I, I know, I'm probably going to get myself in trouble in case any of his followers are listening to this. <laughs> Chances are they will have turned it off by now. <sighs> anyway, when this happens, <laughs> the person will lose contact with the ray of beauty and what happens is then they become manipulating, they become intimidating, and they exploit others. See why that's such a, how we can place a value in that example because it affirms what we're saying and talking about here. They no longer stand for the unifying Christ principle. They can't just hold up a Bible. <laughs> they no longer stand for the unifying Christ principle, the principle of love. That's the Christ principle, the principle of love. When these things happen, the person has spilled the seeds of their chalice. It means they will have to once again go through several lifetimes of suffering, pain, dedicated service, and sacrifice before to build their chalice once again. Spilling the seeds of your chalice is serious to one who is on the evolutionary path. In the book New Era Community, verse 74, it says, we must uplift our chalice. This means we must not hide our light and love and beauty from others, but to demonstrate it through our work, see our duties and responsibilities, in our relationships, and in our labor to reflect hierarchy and the other worlds. So if you recognize that your talent, your resources, from, or from the chalice, 
then is it not your duty to protect and manifest it in the most righteous way? Is it not your duty to protect the treasures which blossom forth through you and to you? How do we protect our chalice? As Nicholas Rourke wrote, it has been repeatedly inscribed on the scrolls of command that a spiritual garden is in daily need of some watering as a garden of flowers. If we still consider flowers as precious adornments, he writes, or our life, then how much more must we remember and prescribe to the creative values of the spirit which surrounds us? And that was from the book Realm of Light. He also said, let us then with untiring eternal vigilance benevolently mark the manifestation of our co-workers and let us strive in every possible way to ease the path of heroic achievement. Maya Angelou wrote how important it is for us to recognize and celebrate our heroes and she rose. Remember that? The treasury of our chalice, the chalice of the group, of the teaching must be cared for in the most benevolent of conditions. How do we create the most benevolent conditions? By advancing the standard of our life and the group life by continuing on the work of our self-sacrificing teachers and sowing their seeds. And let me close with this. An interesting thing is that many ages we have lived and many ages we have collected beautiful things in our chalice. Some of us built that chalice a little, two, three, or four petals, but Master M said, many lives that accumulated treasury remains there. But once the concept of brotherhood hits your mind, it resounds and starts to radiate out and the treasures come. In Revelation, St. John was talking to the angel and he said, who are those multitudes that all have white dresses? beautiful, shining, victorious crowns. Oh, these are the people who came from tribulations. They sacrificed their lives continuously. They killed themselves for the welfare of humanity day and night. And eventually they cleaned all their clothes, their physical, emotional, and mental bodies, and they reached here. These are the masters of wisdom, the great brotherhood that stands as a guide and as a shelter and as a shield for humanity to protect them from cosmic attacks. So the master is saying, if you think about the brotherhood, suddenly you will see the chalice. It is bubbling up and inspiration is coming. Creativity is coming because everybody's chalice is a flower in their garden. Isn't that beautiful?